So, we created an animal, okay, an animal class, uh, and we did lots of uh, operator overloading exercises on it. Operator overload, I'm not going to go through everything, but I will put one extra session online at night. Anybody who wants to, and I'm going to go full through all different types of operator overloading and see what it is. Um, now, quickly, I, I'm going to ask you the question now. How many people are, are okay for Wednesday night? And it's not, if you can't do it, it's not that I'm not going to do it, sorry. If the majority is available at certain night, then I'll do it at that time. How many people are okay? And it's, when I'm talking about night, I mean after 9, 10 o'clock at night for like two hours till 12 o'clock at night. We go online, all of us, and uh, we're going to have a session. So Wednesdays, how many people Wednesday night can be? Be responsive. Okay. Uh, Thursday night? Please, no Friday night. Friday night? <laughs> Seriously, don't you have a life? <laughs> okay, now, Saturday night. Okay, Wednesday it is, I think. So, uh, today is Wednesday, right? You want it tonight? Or you want it next Wednesday? Review for the for operator overloading through everything. So I'm going to literally go through every ch different shapes of operator overloading we have. Yes. Yeah, I will record it. But the way I see it, the, the, the audio they're saying it's not good. So I'll, tr I'll do it, and I'm hoping that it's going to be good. Over there, I'm going to have a headset. Uh, and ho uh, hopefully, it's going to be much better. And, I'm, and it's not over wireless, so it's going to be recorded properly, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, sure, I will record it. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be recorded. It's got to be recorded. Yes. No, no. Haven't you heard about Big Blue Button? I said Big Blue Button is a is a teaching tool where 200 people can log in at the same time. It's audio, video, slide. It's as if you are here. The only difference is that I'm not there. You hear me from the speakers. And you see the mouse move, and you see everything on your computer. OK, all you need to do is need to have is a browser. I strongly suggest either Chrome or Firefox, because they use WebRTC. The audio is pretty good. Internet Explorer is pretty crappy, and, uh, and the other one too. So, so either Chrome or Firefox, one of these two, log into your uh, account. So what you do, you go to the um, you go to the uh, uh, to your uh, you log into your internet account and that I'm not logged into now. Let me just see. Oh, okay, it got connected. All right. So yeah, you go to uh, you go to your account. You log into my Seneca, and then you log into uh, uh, you click on the you click on your on the subject uh, OP two four four AB. Then you click on Tools, and here is big blue button. You click on big blue button, and then you click launch. Okay. Make sure you have a headset, and don't tell me, don't tell me I don't have a headset. There we go. There's a headset right there, over there. So make sure you have a headset. Why? Because you can hear more clearly, and you can take part in discussion. When you launch it, it's going to say microphone or listen only. I don't want anybody to come and listen only. I want you to come in with a microphone so you can ask questions. We don't have, I don't have time to read your text messages halfway through the lecture. You should be able to stop me like now, OK? Say, I have a question. Stop me, ask the question so we can actually go through it, all right? So try to be interactive. You don't need to have a webcam. I don't want to see your faces. You don't need to see my face. So we are fine. Um, all you need to do is to have some kind of a microphone. You click on Launch, and three years later, it's going to come up. Um, and you're going to say join session. And when you say join session, it comes up with this thing. Listen only microphone. You click on microphone. After you click on microphone, you, you have to hear your own echo. So when it 
connects, you say one, two, three. If you hear your own one, two, three, it means it's fine. So one, two, oh, you're not on the, I don't know. But anyways, it works. Then you click on yes, and then you're in. Uh, I'm going to say yes, and then I'm going to log off. So I'm going to log out. All right. So that's that. All right. We created an animal. We went through a, a series of operator overloadings. Uh, we have done something in section B that we didn't do, do in A. So in section B, I overloaded the cast operator, which means uh, if you overload the cast operator, it means whenever the compiler needs to cast your object to that type, that's going to get fired up. So I see it says at line 15, it says uh, operator bool const. It means if in a scenario my animal is being checked for truth or falsehood, then the compiler calls that one to know what is the situation, which in this case, I am returning is empty or not is empty. So let me uh, go to a vertical thing. So as you see, that Boolean thingy says is empty. So in my test, if I have uh, a scenario in which I go if C and C is an animal, like that, then that cast will be called because now C is being checked as a condition, right? True or false. Because it's being checked as a condition, compiler tries to convert it to Boolean. And it immediately goes to the operator overloading to see if you have implemented that. It sees that you did it, and then it comes called this function, there's the, uh, the, uh, the casting operator, and then it's a go after that. It calls the thing and finds out if it's true or false. So that was for section, uh, uh, for section B. And also, uh, I think at section B, we returned a constant character pointer as for the operator equal. So when we are setting uh, the name, so essentially line 13 does what line 12 does, but as an operator. So instead of for setting the name, you can actually set an animal to a character string, and automatically that's going to get called. Um, and then we're going to come down over here for section A. We overloaded uh, the the I/O operations, so so we can actually display uh, the animal instead of uh, showing the name. I can actually go C out A and show the animal like uh, uh, any other thing that I do in C language. So essentially, instead of having C name, I can actually say C out. C now, and that actually shows the animal like a regular thing, okay? So what happens when I say C out C, what happens is that it looks at the operator, it looks at left side of the operator, and it sees there is an O stream over there. It looks at right side, there is an animal over there. So it tries to find an operator in C out that accepts an animal. But C out is not an object that you can edit. Therefore, you create a helper. And I mentioned helpers are only good when you are incapable of doing something. So you don't overload operators if you can make it a member. If you can overload an operator as a member, you do it. If you can't, then you use a helper. That's extremely important. So we don't have access to source code of C out. That's why we actually overload it so it can handle it. That is this one. At left side, I have o, o stream. At right side, I have a constant animal. So it actually accepts that and calls this operator, which comes over here. All right? So it actually calls that one. And when it calls this one, now I need to see how I can actually access the guts of the animal and actually show the animal. The worst way to do it is to make that function a friend of a class. In the other class I mentioned, what are friends good for? Knife in the back. 
Remember, friends in object orientation are only knife in the back. You never, ever use a friend unless there is ownership involved. And I always mention it. A friendship in object orientation is like having a dog. Your dog is your friend. No, it's not. It's your property. You can kill it anytime you want to. And don't get, no, no, no. Yeah, you can. Tomorrow, go to the vet. Done. OK? It's like 50 bucks. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm sorry. I know you have affections for it. It's your friend. But it's your, you have ownership. That's what it is in object orientation. If if an object is friend of another object, it's actually its owner because it has access to it, to everything that it has. So it should not happen. You and I being friend is me being your slave. You don't want that. That doesn't work in object. So it's friendship in object orientation is slavery. Okay? So you should avoid it in all costs. Otherwise, you, unless it's an animal that you're having, a donkey or something, right? So that's what it is, all right? So that's why instead of making it a friend, I actually create a method inside the animal that does the display and call that one. So essentially, I'm asking for animal's way to printing itself. So no privacy is, uh, is overwritten over here. And again, I mentioned in the other class, when you are doing C in and C out overload, the signature of your function should always be receiving an O stream and returning. So the O stream that is printing should flow through the, the display and flow through the read. So I stream should flow through the read. Why? Again, because the sky is high, you don't know why at this moment. I'm just asking you to trust me. If you are overloading C in and C out, Definitely, you are not making it a friend. When you create a display and a read function, make sure you pass the C out through it. It is extremely important for you to do so. You'll find out later on why. And then you do it. And uh, essentially, uh, by uh, printing like this, indirectly, you are calling the display of the animal. And it shows the animal. And we are done, finished. Now. Any questions down to here? Yes. Why, why this cannot be a member function? OK. Uh, how does a member function work? You have two objects, right? A member operator. The left object, the left object is the owner of the operator, correct? So the operator has to be a member of that, correct? But this is a library object. How can you put add something? Are we OK? Yes. If I do this and not do this, I mean, if I make it a friend, what's going to happen? If I make it not a friend, what's going to happen? Oh, you don't see anything. It's not visible. Yeah. Uh, doing something illegal is not visible. They both work. OK, I can go 150 kilometers in a, in a highway. It works. The difference is that I may die. That's what it is. So I'm saying it's not good. Don't do it. OK? It's like I'm saying, be polite. Wear something decent when you're coming out. You can come out naked, but you shouldn't. That's what I'm saying. Friends, not good in object orientation unless you have to, unless there is ownership involved. We'll come to it. OP345, you'll understand. Yes. Pardon me? Yes, ownership. Uh, may, like, let's say, again, I, I gave this example. This is something that kind of you can understand at this moment. Let's say you want to simulate an array, an object of type array has elements, correct? So you actually have two classes. You have an array class that has lots of instances of element class inside, if you want to simulate an array, right? If you want to do that. If that's the case, the class array becomes friend of element. 
because an element can, I cannot say, this is an element. You've got to say element of what? An element cannot exist without an array. An element is highly dependent to, a, to an array. So an array owns an element. Therefore, an array is a friend of element, and it has to be. That's a good way of doing it. All right? You will see later on with friendship in classes, classes like this are usually fully private. Like an element class is fully private, which means even the constructor is private to everyone else other than element who's its friend. So an element can, so, uh, uh, sorry, to array. So an array can create an element, but no one else can. You just don't put a public in it. <laughs> And make it a yeah, and make the class a friend of it. Anyways, we'll 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 learn it later on. But these are the things that yeah. All right, so we're downtown to this point. Now we are going to current stuff. So we had three functions over here. We had forget all about the reviews that we have done and focus on three functions in the animal, three methods in the animal. Act, move, and sound. So these are the things that we are actually focusing on. Okay? These are the stuff we are focusing on. Now, just a second. Oh, I opened the wrong solution. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. Yes, that's perfect. So, now that we have an animal, let's make something out of an animal. What do we make out of an animal? We're going to make a cat out of an animal. OK? We are going to make a cat out of an animal. OK. So it's the same thing as we had before. So I'm just going to close everything in here. We don't need them. Close all documents. So I have my animal as I had it before, absolutely no difference. And as I mentioned before, please only, only concentrate on these three and nothing else. Okay? These three are what we, what we are dealing with right now. All right? So that's that one. OK, so for some reason, I don't have that include IO stream in here. And using, uh, that's it. Yeah, that's better. All right. So that's the animal. Now, if you want to have a cat, a cat is actually an animal, OK? To create a cat out of an animal, all you need to do is to create a class called cat, and they say this cat is publicly inherited from an animal. So by adding public animal, you are saying everything a cat has, a an animal has, I will have. So all properties of animal and are now part of cat which means a name, right? An animal had a name, right? You don't need to put that one over there. But cat has one extra feature, number of lives, right? They say you have nine lives, right? So you need to know how many lives that cat has. So therefore, it has one extra thing. Do you need to put a name for this cat? No, you don't. The animal has it, OK? Now, in here, I created exactly what, had, what an animal has. I created an act, a move, a sound. I can simply remove them all. 
So I can go to my cat.cpp and I say, I do not want those things at all. So if I remove all those things, nothing's going to go wrong. I have a cat out of an animal that has number of lives and nothing else over there is important for me. I have a constructor. In constructor cat, I am passing the name. By, by default, the name of my cat is Garfield. And I get number of lives that by default is nine. I can change it if I want to. Now, when I want to actually create the animal, it's like it, create the cat, it's like you are creating a second story on a first story building. So you have a one story building, and you want to have the second one over it. If you want to do that, you need to have the first one. You cannot build the second story without the first one, right? That's how it is. Two-story building meets the first floor. Now, the first floor's plan in this one is from animal, which means when you create the cat, you have to mention to the compiler how to build the animal first so it can make the cat over it. So the object cat is actually built up of two pieces, an animal piece and an extra piece that was cat. Now, if I look at the animal, Oh, if I look at the source code of CPP, I'll see that in here I have the constructor. But in this area, what is this area called? What do I call it? It's the thing that I called, and it's not in any book. I call it initialization area. Please remember that, initialization area. You see the first part? I have animal name. You see that? Okay, I am essentially telling to the compiler, when building a cat, first build the animal with the same name. So essentially, it passes the name of the cat to the animal, so animal takes care of it. We've already done that, so we don't need to worry about it. Animal had dynamic memory allocation. It comes from it. Animal knew how to take care of it when it dies. It, 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 takes care of it. Animal knew that it, it is not supposed to get copied. It comes with it. So all the features of animal is already created. Again, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If I am creating a motorcycle, I just get a bicycle and stick an engine. It's done. I don't need to reinvent everything from scratch. I have a design. I reuse it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's unit test that we're going to write. It's in a main. We're going to write it. Yeah. So what happens is that, again, there is, remember I told you, you can set the properties of a class in here. You can initialize the properties of a class in the initialization area. If you put it afterwards, it's not initialization. It's setting. Remember that? Remember that? Anyone? Do you remember that? You do? All right, so what I'm saying is that, and this is one of the most important moments of your life about in inheritance, please. Ear hearing aids on, okay? <laughs> hearing ears on, not hearing aids. Hearing ears on. Now, please listen to me very carefully. I could choose to initialize something or set it, right? So I can just remove this one, and the outcome for me is the same because number of lives is a primitive thing, right? It's a primitive variable. What's a primitive variable? Integer care stuff that comes with the language, so it doesn't have a constructor. There is no default constructor that I'm worried about or anything like that. So if I put it over there or here, it does not make any difference. Now listen to me carefully. In inheritance, you can never ever break the initialization of the parent. That's why you can't listen some, sometimes. You can never, ever, you can never, ever bring the initialization of the parent within the code. You can't. Remember I told you, you cannot call a constructor. Remember that? I'm going to put that in final exam. Can you call a constructor? True, false. Let's see if you're going to fall for it or not. Okay, so this code 
is incorrect. I cannot do this, people. I get no error, right? But it's not going to work. I'll show you why and how and everything. That is not going to work. This will not work. You know what's going to happen? At line 9, at line 9, a cat is going to get created, correct? When the cat is created, did you mention how to create an animal? How to initialize it? No. So the animal part of the cat will be defaulted. If you have a default constructor for animal, the animal part of the cat will be defaulted. Then, at line 10, a temporary nameless animal will come to being. So at line 10, an animal gets created. The name will be the name of the cat, and it will die right at the semicolon and go away. So for a fraction of a second, between line 9 and 11, you're going to have an animal, and it's going to be gone. Because you cannot call a constructor. See how many times I'm telling you this. Some people come from Java. In Java, you can do that. You cannot do it at C++, OK? You cannot call a constructor. You can instruct the compiler how to build a class using its parents' constructors by putting it in initialization area. But you cannot call a constructor. So this is wrong. We can't do this. This is fine. I even don't like to set it over here. So that's why I always like to put that thing up there too and comment that one. Okay. Initialize everything. Why well, you have to create, create it and then set it? Just initialize it. Yes, sir. Okay. A what? A single character? Let's say you say you have a single character A, a character CH or character CH10. Mm -hmm. So how do you initialize it? You can't, because array is not a single entity. So you cannot initialize an array. So that's, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. No, you can't do it. That's why you have to set it. Arrays, they have to be set, sadly. You cannot initialize them because it's not a single entity. OK? You'll find out later on that uh, in in your C++, there's a way around it, but you can't do it. Yes. So, right? Oh, you can, yeah. Like, you want to make sure, you want to put it in a safe, empty state? Is that what you're saying? Mm. If, yeah, if you're initialized it, you're saying, I can't, I, how do I do testing? I can't do testing go with it. I cannot set it to zero if it was negative. <laughs> right? That's why you want to put it in a setting area. Correct? Yeah, if you have a complex thing, if you have a complex thing that you're supposed to do in here, the yes, then you can't put it in an initialization area. If there is a logic you have to follow to see how that thing's going to happen, then you can. Or what you can do is simply create a method that does the logic for you and call it over here. Right? You can do that. Create a method that does something for you, checks the validation or whatever it is, and call it, and it returns whatever you want to do. Or, for example, if I wanted to make sure that if they put over there, if the number of lives is negative, I want to set it to 9. OK? I want to make sure that they don't make a mistake. So what I'm going to do over here, I'm going to say number of lives less than 0, then put 9, otherwise put number of lives. There you go. That's my safe, empty state logic for it. I can do that. 
it's C, like you can, you can write whatever, you can do a function call over there, you can do whatever you want in there, right? So you could do it if you want to, but. Uh, yeah, but if it's, if it's too confusing and it doesn't matter if it's defaulted, then bring it down, do the logic. You don't have to always initialize. I just like it, that's all, yes. You know what he said now? You know what did he say? I have a question. When you go to Subway, and not Subway, the, the, the Subway, Subway, the sandwich, and you buy a sandwich, you eat it like this, or you eat it like this? <laughs> That's, yeah, that's doing it. So what he's saying is, could I do this? Could I say, <sighs> the implications of this is so big and so crazy that I cannot tell you. First of all, you see that you have to upcast that one. So what it does, at any moment when you write something like this, especially when you want to do assignment operator stuff that they use this equal to something. When you do something, this is a very expensive thing. What happens with this is that a temporary nameless object gets created. Assignment between that and current object will happen, and after that, that object will die. Why? Because you are lazy to write it up there. Don't do this. I, this. Is this what you were talking about? Yeah, but not in a constructor first. You do this in assignment operator and stuff like that, usually, or in copy constructor, right? When they're assigned an object. Remember, this is a cat. This is an animal. So content of this is a cat, but the object over here is an animal. So you're essentially saying cat is equal to an animal. So you have to handle that first. You have to know what happens when a child gets assigned to a parent. If you don't know that, then you'll be in trouble. See, when you say, oh, I call default constructor, I want to come and beat you up. You don't call the constructor. You create a temporary nameless object. People think it's just a function call. It's not. It's an expensive thing. You literally built an object and build a nameless object and pass that object and tell the compiler, kill it when you don't want it anymore. You never call a constructor. Anything that looks like a call, it's request for creation of a temporary nameless object. So essentially, all casts in C++ happens that way. Remember that when you came at the beginning of the semester, they told you cast in C language, the parentheses go around the type, but in C, in C++, the parentheses go around the, the variable to cast something. So you're essentially creating a temporary nameless object that it dies after. It's expensive. Don't do it, okay? Uh, remember, constructors never get called. Yes. Yeah, do it manually. Do safe empty state. If, uh, if A is supposed to be 2, make it 2. Write the code. It is, imp it is impossible for you to have to do that. That problem can easily be fixed with another method. Create a method called set empty. Call that function. Do not use temporary nameless objects. They are expensive. Don't use them. Let's pass through this. OK, so now the constructor is actually called. Animal gets created, and animal dies right after, right? So now if I actually go to the, the tester program in here, you will see that I'm telling cat, act, cat, move, cat, sound. 
but I do not have any implementation for those. I commented that. So cat is not implementing move or anything. So cat is simply an empty shell over animal. So when I actually run this beautiful program of mine, the only thing that happens is that three years later, four years later, five years later, I'm going to see that it says creating Fluffy the animal, creating Fluffy the cat. That's the constructor of the cat and the animal happening because they're, both of them are happening, right? So I know the cat is created. But then it says act like Fluffy the animal. There is no cat because cat did not implement the actions of its parents. Because of that fact, cat will act like an animal. If I want the cat to act like a cat and not like the animal, I have to implement those actions specifically for cat. So I have to actually mention, hey, you should act this way now that you're a cat and not an animal anymore. So now if you look at it, only act is implemented and not the rest. So when I run this program now, you will see the difference in, in that when I tell the animal to act, so let me show you the code. When I tell the cat to act, cat will act playfully like a cat because the action is overwritten now. And then, but move is not, sound is not. Therefore, it still moves and sounds like an animal, but acts like a cat. My father actually was a teacher. He used to teach mechanics, okay? But we sound alike. I did not implement a new sound for myself. If you ask me to teach, I'm going to teach computer science, not mechanics, because I didn't take the action of teaching from my father. I overwritten it with a new method of my own. But because I did not overwrite his talking, I, I actually sound like him. OK? So that's how it happens. If you want anything new to be added, you do it. All the other good stuff that animal has, that is dynamic memory allocation and the Boolean operator and all those, is empty. And all the things that it has to make animal be a dynamic function uh, class, it is inherited. You don't need to re-implement that because they're all good. The things you need to implement is moving and sounding so they actually go, it, this animal is actually going to act like a cat. So all the methods that I want to, to improve in a cat, in an animal, I'll improve it. And when I do that, and if you think parts of animal has something that you want to use, so I want the cat, I want the cat to make a sound but the sound of animal has to still be there. If that's the case, you can explicitly call the parent sound in the animal, in the cat sound. So I can say, cat, sound like this. First, call the sound of your, sound of your parent. So first, sound like an animal. Now say meow. So the cat not only sounds like a, a cat, but an animal too. But the other ones, I do not want any action of the parent. I want the cat to completely act like a cat and not like an animal. I want it to completely move like a cat and not like an animal. But when it comes to sound, I want it to sound like an animal that is cat. Therefore, I call the animal part in it. So you can always reuse the parent's method to implement and modify the actions of the child, but it's not a must. You can uh, overwrite it completely if you wish to, yes. Yes. Is there, you have to qualify it? Always. Otherwise, if you, if you just say sound over here, remember, there is a rule of a function call. <laughs> Extremely important. There is a rule of a function call in inheritance. When you make a function call, a method call, a member function call, always the one that is closer to you will be called. Always. Remember this rule. When you call a method, it looks, which one is closer? Picks that one up. It does not going to go five things back to do it unless you force it to do so.
Okay, one of the ways of forcing to do so is to qualify, to mention, I want, and as you see, this is a scope resolution, it's not a dot. Because sound belongs to animal and cat is an animal. So it just says, call the sound part of my parent or my, of my mother. Okay, so now if I run this beautiful program of mine, three years later, It's not going to run? Is it run? Did it run? Yeah, there you go. So now if I look at this, you will see that I created Fluffy the cat, fluff, uh, animal, cat, act play for, act move like a cat, sound like Fluffy the animal, and then say meow. So the sound part is doing the both things. Something that I want to attract your interest into is the uh, is the destructor. When the cat is dying over here, when the cat is dying, they're both going away. All right? Are we okay with that? All right. Why? Because I created a cat. When I kill a cat, the animal is going to be gone too. Okay, it's going to take nine times, but it's going to die. All right? Are we okay with this? Are we okay? One. Are we okay too? Yes, sir. I'm going to bring personal microphones for you guys. Yeah, go ahead. One for you, one for you. Yeah. Assuming that maybe we have a toy and put it in classes, nested classes, I guess. It's not nested classes, it's a chain of inheritance. Okay. 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 So that four structures will fall to our scope? Yes. Can we combine them into one structure? Is that a bad idea? You can. How can you combine, like, each one don't knows how to die? They all know how to die, okay? It's, not, it's a samurai thing. They know exactly how to die. So you have to let them die the way they want. So essentially, when, when objects go off scope, they have to clean up uh, their mess. And each object, through its constructor, I'll come to you, don't worry, for two hours, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell. Okay, so each object knows how to clean up after itself. So when you call the destructor, automatically it's going to destroy from top to bottom. So if you have a cat, let's say I have, um, I'm going imp imp to soon go to an animal kingdom here. Well, you're going to have series of inheritance. When we come to it, I'll explain this. But essentially, it, the objects die in reverse order. Because when they are getting, like you created a cat, first animal gets created and then cat, right? And when they are dying, first animal is, uh, first cat is removed and then animal. It's always reverse order. Yes, sir. So, uh, Professor, you just didn't uh, uh, have, uh, have it was like the lack of purity, the animal, you didn't support sound and the function. Oh, yes, I did. I called the animal. For the animal, oh, the, the discord in the animal. Yeah, that's, yes, uh, not constructing, animal sound. So this line is animal making a sound. It's, well, let me bring it up. So essentially, when you look at the cat, in the cat, I am saying animal sound, so this, is essentially the sound of the animal coming. And then I say meow. And if you look at the animal, it's from the animal sound. Yes, there you go. Sound like the animal. You see that? Sound like fluffy the animal. All right? That's what we intended to. We wanted the cat to still sound like an animal and then say meow. All right? Are we? All the other member functions, like is empty and all those, they are accessible. They are like an animals. It doesn't make any difference. Okay? There is one thing you need to know. There is one thing you need to know is, and that's the private keyword in a parent. So this is essential. Oh, we didn't mention it, but this is private. You know that, right? All right? It is private. All the public stuff of, of a parent is accessible directly in a child. 
with no restriction. But the private parts are not. The private parts of a, of a parent, of a base class, is not accessible to the child unless through the accessors of the class. So if the cat wants to later on change the name of the animal somehow, it has to call the setter for the name. It cannot directly change the name. You follow? What I'm saying is that I said when you create a cat, cat has access to all parts of the animal. That's true and false at the same time. In here, I cannot say SDR copy into M name whatever. I can't do that because M name that is the animal's name and cat is inheriting it, it's a private thing. Okay? And you only have access to it through animal's method. So you can actually call the name method of the animal to set that. Okay? Like oh, yes, the member functions can. Yeah. Okay. You, of course. It's like two seconds. It's like you want to borrow your father's car. It's private, it's your father's. You can't do it, but if you ask for permission, it's going to give you the key, hopefully, and you're going to go for a ride. not member function of the cat. Cat has no access to it. It only can use the member functions of the animal to manipulate that. Uh, oh yeah, it can have in there. Yeah, yes. Oh yeah, well, we'll come to it soon. Okay. Access hierarchy is two. Two different parts, two different ones. Now I'm gonna because the question came up, I'll explain I'll explain it, but I'm not gonna use it here. Okay? I'll explain it, but I'm not gonna use it here. If now listen to me carefully, listen to me carefully, listen to me carefully. If for any reason, okay, if for any reason the base class wants the child or the children to have access to some of their private stuff, they can make them protected. For example, let's say I want a cat to be able to change the name, but no one else, because cat is an animal. But I don't want anyone else to be able to change the animal's name afterwards. If that's the case, all I need to do is to get the setters of the thing, which is this one and this one. I can bring these up, put it over here, not there. Let's say over here and make this protected. If you make something protected, it means it's private for everyone except my children. Okay? So protected means private for everyone except my children. So main cannot access those. Other classes cannot access those. But if they are inherited, even in 50 different levels, the grand-grandchildren can, can access it because they are children, right? So protected is the one that children can have access to. So cat can call the name method. Cat can call the assignment operator, but no one else can. That is a protected thing, okay? We'll come to it later on uh, when we continue implementation of this. I'm gonna remove it for now because it doesn't make sense. But just remember, protected means private to everyone, but not children, okay? It's like you have a family car at home that everybody can use. You're not allowed to use your dad's car because he doesn't want you to touch the Porsche 911. But the Dodge Caravan is okay for everyone to use. So that becomes protected. I, can, I cannot pick, pick them up. But all the members of the family can. 
Okay, so that Dodge Caravan becomes protected. Porsche 911 is private. You can only use it when your father drives it. Therefore, I know lots of you are already fathers and you know, <laughs> but what I'm just saying, but you, it just makes sense. Are we okay? Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Yes. No, 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 you can say it, but please call me Fardad, don't call me professor, don't call me sir, yes, Fardad. For Fardad, yes. I actually not very care about the children. Ch uh, children? Yes. When I say children, what do I? Every Not children. So who is the child of animal? No, it's cat. Oh. Okay. You got it? You may go. Okay. Okay. Uh, but how do I? Okay, let me give you. I want to give you a good example about protecting in private, in real life. Forget it. For now, let's go for a break, come back, then I'll explain to you. It's not time to go. I'm going to bring up the protected thingy next week, so I'm going to talk about it then. Let's not talk about it now. But just remember that. Let's Now, forget about children. I'm going to tell you one thing and then be done with it. Using children and parent terminology is good for teaching, and that's the worst example you can give. Because in real object-oriented design and inheritance, my father and I are the same instances of the class human male. An object cannot inherit from object. A class can inherit from class. My father is a male mammal. So he's actually getting, he's a child of mammal or a child of human. So let's say to the hierarchy, I have human, I have man, woman, okay? So that's the inheritance part, okay? Okay, so I don't know why they like to make sound like that. All right, I know many of you probably have it right now, parked over there and say, I do that too. Anyways, uh, we want to make a sound when we are going 40 kilometers an hour. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> What do I want to see? I get distracted so easily. Only if they knew. So what I'm saying is that I have animal, okay? Out of animals, I have mammals. You know what mammals are, right? Hopefully. Out of mammals, I have human. Out of human, I have female, woman, and man, right? So man is a child of human. Human is a child of mammal. Is child child of animal. Yes, they are all classes. You cannot say, and I am a human male, right? I am not a, I, I am not child of my father in, in in object orientation. My father and I are same objects. Okay? Actually, this is what happens. Let me tell you, my mother, which is a human male, has a method a function called birth, who returned the human, that was me. So if you want to look at object orientation, my mother had a method, a member function called birth. That birth returned a human. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Break. We come back, we're going to go to virtuality, pure virtuality, and all those good stuff. All right. Now, next step, let's close all the documents. And I want your attention, please. Oh, and I want your attention, please. So 
so close all documents. Now let's take a look at the, uh, the inheritance and kind of put what I just mentioned under assessment. When I said when you call something, when I said when you call something, when you call a method or a member function, always the one that is closest will be called. Always the one that is closest will be called. That's an important thing. All right? Let's look at that. So I'm going to add another project, and that one is this one. Set a startup project. This is essentially the same thing, no difference. So I have the animal, I have the cat with all the good stuff that I had in the other one. The only difference is my main. Take a look at my main now, the cat tester. So what I'm doing, I'm creating a cat, Mr. Fluffy thingy that we have over there, okay? Now, although I hate it, but you can call me Mr. Soleimanli, right? So you can call me with my last name, correct? with my father's signature, all right? That's what exactly you can do in inheritance. If you have a cat, you can always refer to a cat using an animal reference or point to a cat using an animal pointer. There's no problem with that. A cat is an animal. Therefore, you can use the animal reference or pointer to point to a cat. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Yes. That's an example over there right for you. I have animal, AP is an animal pointer and is holding the address of a cat. So you can point to a cat using an animal, okay? So you can point to a cat using an animal. Now I'm going to come over here. So first, I'm going to use the cat's name and tell the cat to act. So let's actually go through this step by step to see how it works out. When it compiles two years later, there you go. Now, loading symbols, shmimbles, come on. Really? That long? What did I do? Oh, it's going through all the projects. Oh, cancel with disable symbol doing. Good. Let's see if it's gonna do anything. Well, let me shake it. Seriously? All right, it started. Okay, so I'm going to come over here. So I create, uh, let me just uh, go to, uh, let me put this one over here. And Okay, so we have a good view, right? So I'm executing line by line, I'm going to go. So that's where, the, that's where the cat got created. So it's creating Fluffy the animal and Fluffy the cat because it has two parts, an animal and a cat, right? Now, Nothing is happening over here. Why? Because I have a reference of an animal pointing to a cat and a pointer of an animal pointing to a cat. No object is created. I have the same object, different things are pointing to it. One is calling it a bag, the other one is calling it as a pencil holder, and the other one is calling it a purse. So it's calling the same thing in three different ways. I have one object, that's why I have one constructor, three different ways of accessing it. Are we okay with this? All right. Now I'm saying cat, act. So when I come over here, I'm going to say cat, act. And what happens, it actually acts like a cat, moves like a cat, and sounds like a cat. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Now I'm coming to the next stage. Now I'm using the animal reference. So I'm going to say animal, act. Is this really an animal? No, it's a cat. You can see it. I only have a cat, right? And the animal is referring to the cat. But because the action is called through an animal, 
which method is closer? The act of the animal, not the cat. So if you tell me, Mr. Solimanlu, teach us, I'm going to teach you mechanics, not computer science anymore, because that's my father's teachings. My father was a mechanics teacher. If you tell me, Mr. Solimanlu, teach, I'm not going to teach computer science, because now you are referring to me as my father, therefore I'm going to act like my father. Remember, a cat has two parts, cat part, animal part. If you say cat act, all the actions of the cat will be called. If you say animal act, then it's not going to go to the cat. It sees the animal, it's going to act like an animal. So it's as if there is no animal over here, a cat over here, and it's going to act like an animal, and an animal keeps going. Same thing with a pointer. If I am pointing to a cat, using an animal pointer. I am telling, look at the animal part of the cat and now do whatever it's supposed to do. Therefore, the actions that you are seeing are actions of an animal, not a cat. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? So, and they are both getting removed. Now I'm gonna do something else. Okay, if I think, let me look at the, all right, now, woohoo, this is going to bake your noodles. Please, take a look at this, it is important. I am changing the main. Now see what's happening. I created cat P whose name is Pepper. Okay? Then I create a cat, but this one is dynamic. It's fluffy. Because it's dynamic, I have to kill it myself. It's not going to be killed by the system. I have to remove it myself. Now, this is the tricky part. I am creating another cat called Tom, but Tom is being kept in an animal pointer, not in a cat pointer. Okay? So, cat Tom has no access like a cat, although it's a cat but there is no cat access for it. I created the cat, but it's just an animal to me. Okay? So, when I run this program, When it's getting created, oh, so you said you're not going to load it again. Cancel. Don't load load thingy for me. Come on. Use magic. Maybe that works. No? Bring some water. Okay, next time I'm going to remove all the other projects. Really? There we go. Okay, so. Now, cat is created, that's pepper, right? This one is dynamic, fluffy, created, right? That is in a cat pointer. Now this one is an animal pointer, right? And here I have a reference to the, the good old cat. This is like the previous one. I don't even know why I have it. So when I say cat act, it's going to act like a cat because a pointer to a cat is a pointing to a to a is calling a cat. Pointer of cat, calling a cat, life is beautiful, nothing's wrong. But in here, I'm, I'm going to refer to the, to the cat that I had to pepper with the, uh, with the animal. So again, it's going to act like an animal, not a cat. We know that, right? Next one. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say animal pointer act. So although I know this animal is a cat, 
but there is no way for me to make it act like a cat because I have no access to a cat. It only has one handle, and that handle is an animal, which this is a problem for me. I just created a cat which I cannot use. And now I say delete the cat. It deletes delete cat, delete animal pointer. Rem please notice, I want to attract your attention. I deleted the animal pointer. What happened? Both cat side and animal part got removed, right? R all these things, please remember, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to go back to animal. Remember I told you from now on, write virtual in front of the, in front of the destructor, and I say, I'm not going to tell you why. Now I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to remove that virtual now and make it a regular destructor so it's not virtual anymore. All right? Now let's run it again. Please don't load symbols. All right. So now, what happened? Stop. That's why the other computer was pretty good, because it was faster than this. When you have so many different projects open, let me do something in here. So I'm going to remove this animal, remove, remove cat, remove, no, do we already here now? Okay, and remove this one. Hopefully that's going to make it easier. Okay, now let's run it again. No, I think that symbol thing is. Give it a second, please. I want to make sure that it builds it once, and then hopefully it's not going to build it again. Nope. Same thing. Come on. Sorry about this. Not my fault. Come on. From Microsoft Symbol Server. So it's actually going to servers. Oh. Maybe I should disable the internet. Oh, there you go. Son of a gun. OK, so now, please remember, now the destructor is not virtual, OK? I create a cat, Pepper, Fluffy, and Tom, right? And everything is working perfectly. It's going right down to here. Now, please pay attention here. C is of type animal pointer, correct? Sorry, cat pointer, correct? And AP is of type animal pointer. When I delete C, what happens? Removing Fluffy the cat and Fluffy the animal. Now I'm going to remove animal pointer. What happened? Only the animal part is removed. The cat part, memory leak. What just happened? OK. Keep that in mind. That, that virtual thingy made sure that memory leak doesn't happen. Remember, one of the things, how to prevent memory leaks? Make sure your destructors are always virtual. That's one of the things. Many things you need to do, but that's one of them. Now, please, listen to me carefully. Let's go back. Let's go back in here. So now, I'm going to come back over here. How can I guarantee? How can I make sure that the action of a cat is always the action of a cat, 
no matter how I refer to it? How do I guarantee that when I ask Farda to teach, he's going to teach computer science no matter how I call him? If I call him Fardat, I want computer science. If I call him Mr. Solimando, I want computer science. If I say professor, I want computer science. No matter how I refer to Fardat, I want computer science to be taught. The latest skill of mine to show up. How you do that? By making the parent's skill a fake one. What is fake? Virtual. So if you go and in the parent, in the animal, you make the action virtual, you are telling to the compiler, hey compiler, when the action of the animal is called, check. See if there is any newer action available. If there is, call it. Don't call this one. So what happens over here is this. I'm going to clear the, the main so it becomes easier to understand. I'm going to remove everything in here. The only thing that I'm going to have is the animal pointer. So now I made the action of the cat virtual, correct? action of the animal virtual. So animal says my action is virtual. If I have a child and that child is implementing an action, ignore mine. Always call the child's. If I do that, now see what happens. When I run the program, hopefully it's going to run immediately, not five years. All right. So when I run the program, Stupid Microsoft. Ah. I don't know if it went through or it's still. Pardon me? No. Then it doesn't matter. The parents got to get called. If my father was a teacher and I got this call from my father and I don't know how to teach computer science, then I'm going to teach mechanics. So if I do not have the action of the parent, then fine. Okay? So now look at this. I'm going to come over here and now I'm going to say act. So it's going to, now I'm saying act. It's going to act like Tom the cat. But the rest of them are not virtual, so it's going to be animal. If I make those virtual, if I make those virtual, then everything's going to be virtual, and I'm going to be fine. And everything's going to be cats. So as you see, Everything is acting like a cat without me having a reference to a cat because I am saying all the actions of the cat, of the animal, is virtual except destructor, so I still have memory leak. That's why you always make a destructor virtual. Why? In case you are making a destructor virtual, so just in case, if somebody inherits, inherits from your class, you will make sure that always the latest version of the destructor is called. That is the child's, and therefore everything gets wiped out. The definition of virtual, if you go to a, an interview, they ask you, what is a virtual method? Or what does virtuality do? This is the textbook definition for it. Virtuality guarantees that the latest version of the action is always called, no matter how you refer to the object. So again, virtuality guarantees 
that the latest version of the method is always called. Now, of course, as our friend asked over, said over here, what if you have a virtual method in the parent, but the child doesn't have it? What if cat doesn't have a move at all? If cat doesn't have a move and the parent has a virtual move over here, what's going to happen? Is it going to give me an error? No, it's not going to give you an error. All it's going to do, because there is no latest version, it's going to move like an animal. What did I do? Yeah, so as you see, act playful like a cat, but it's going to move like an animal. The animal's action, uh, move is virtual, but the child is not implementing it. Therefore, the parents is going to get called. All right? So again, this is virtuality. Whenever you have inheritance and you have methods and you want to guarantee if the child, the derived classes, implement this to make sure that the latest version will be called, you have to make them virtual. If you don't make them virtual, then user have a selection. If they are, they can, they can actually, uh, if, if they point to a child using a parent's pointer or reference, then the parent's going to get called. An important thing to remember, the keyword virtual, this is very important, the keyword virtual doesn't mean anything. It literally means nothing if you don't have a parent being, ref if you don't have a child being referred to by a parent's reference. The only reason you have virtuals is because you refer to children with their parents' pointer. If you don't have that case, then virtuals don't mean jack. You don't care. Who cares? You only look for virtuals if you have a child being pointed by a parent. Otherwise, it does not matter at all. Zero interest. Zero interest. Okay, so again, if you are doing a walkthrough and you are seeing you have a class that has lots of virtuals in it and there are 50 classes inherited from this, but in your main, you created an instance of the parent and you are calling the functions, then there is no child. Virtuals don't mean anything. Virtuals only mean something when a child is present and it is being referred by a parent. Yes. How what? One more time. How what? Oh, how, how, how virtual prevents memory leak? Okay, so what happens is that What's the time? Anybody has the time? Uh, 120? 128? One, one oh, we are gone. I'll explain to you. I'll explain to you uh, the, uh, the next day you are coming in. OK? All right. Please remember to ask me again. Can we make a constructor virtual? No, it doesn't make sense. But think about it for a second. Constructors, they don't have a signature. I, the latest version of a con doesn't make sense. Okay.